What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Miles, and in today's episode, I'm going to be looking through the current state of the market, going through the Ethereum chart, looking at the latest net inflow data to work out where we are sitting. Are we simply in a continued bull market, or is this simply a bear market rally? I'm going to be doing my best to answer that question in today's show. I'm also going to be going through some of the tokens that have been performing very well lately, like the Doge chain ecosystem, with massive two to three thousand percent gains on some of these altcoins, and looking at a why it's pumping and b if i think the rally on these meme coins can actually sustain and obviously looking through some of the altcoins that i think could perform strongly over the coming months as the real yield narrative takes place it's going to be a general market update we're going to go through lots of topics i have a lot of alpha to share with you guys from the past week of research the first thing i want to go through is the ethereum chart we know right now that ethereum is generally leading the altcoins Headed into the Ethereum merge in September, there has been a lot of speculative bets placed on Ethereum and its ecosystem as to whether the merge will be successful or not. Personally, I don't view the full success of the merge being fully priced in. Why don't I believe this is the case? Well, the markets are always forward looking, which means they're always going to price in a percentage chance that the merge doesn't take place on its desired date or the percentage chance that there is an error with the merge. We know the merge is slated to go through on September 15th. So as, as we edge closer to this date, we'll get more of an indication as to what percentage the market is pricing the merge of going through. I believe if the merge does go through on the date on September 15th, then we should see a sustained rally from the Ethereum price, simply off the premise that the market is pricing in risk. At the same time, we have seen a little bit of a decline in the Ethereum price as exemplified via breaking support at this key $1,900 region. And we broke support, which indicates that some key figures are starting to go risk off, like Gallo Capital, who actually started a, an Ethereum short position in order to hedge against its longs. And it started to flip slightly bearish on Ethereum, saying that it is overextended in the short term. To an extent, I would agree. And I would explain this as the primary reason behind why we did get this pullback. We went from $2,000 now down to $1,850, largely off the back of the fact that the market was getting overheated. A lot of these altcoins were pumping nonstop. The Ethereum price had pumped all the way from $950 up to 2023. I think it's only fair to assume that the market at some point is going to have to pull back. This is also coinciding with the SPY, which is the S&P 500, which has been very, very bullish lately. And even though crypto has performed well, Bitcoin itself actually has not performed as strongly as the share market during this rally. So I think there's some general fears out there that if the SPY comes back down and we're starting to get some indicators that the RSIs on that front are quite high, then the crypto market will take a hit. So that is why I'm watching the SPY so closely, because if we do get a stock market reversal, crypto prices can go lower. But for now, the crypto specific trend is fully related to the merge, hence why I track the Ethereum chart. So what are my key levels on the Ethereum chart right now? Well, after breaking 19 1917, this orange box for me has to hold. The lowest I think we can really go is 1785 um, to maintain bullish continuation on the four hourly. On the daily, if you switch timeframes, we can see that we have another key level of 1700. Um, and if we drop below the 1630 to 1700 range, that would be a very bearish indicator for Ethereum. And that would likely signal both a decline in Bitcoin and stocks. Now, Ethereum leading the market, we don't want to see that happen. We would like to obviously, um, on the bullish side of things, see Ethereum hold in this orange box and potentially push to the upward side and reclaim this support trend. Worst case scenario, we want to see a bounce between 1630 and 1700. So just keep your eyes on those key levels because until we break it, I don't think there is any um, reason to panic, any reason to flip too bearish any reason to call the top in, there's still a large chance that we can come up and, and try and make new highs again. We haven't broken structure and that is the exact same thing with Bitcoin. The 23K level is still that key level and we haven't broken it yet. If we were to break, we do have this major liquidity pocket at two, um, 21.5 to 21.85. That is a very key area to hold as well and that would kind of be our next stop um, or our lowest bullish cont continuation scenario. So that is what the charts are telling me. They're telling me not to panic. Um, be very cautious and make sure you're not using crazy leverage in this market right now because it is quite unpredictable. But until we break these major trends, um, we can verify that we still have a relative bullish structure and that Ethereum can continue to push up pre-merge. I'm not, I'll show you my trades at the end of the show, um, but I'm not doing any crazy longing or, uh, and I especially wouldn't be doing any crazy shorting into this market because of this one chart here. And this is 
the DXY. So it's the dollar currency index. It tracks the value of the US dollar versus other currencies and commodities and equities, etc. And we can see that the DXY is actually currently in an uptrend. Although we did have a break to the downside um, of that shorter time frame trend. We are seeing bounces off this support line. We have lower long-term support, but we are also hovering in this upper support channel. Um, and we saw the bounce at 95, 97, and also 104. Now, what does this mean? Well, there are some fears currently coming out of China due to the current jobs um, and housing data that they're printing that they may have some economic issues. And obviously, since the West is... is um, is home to a lot of foreign investment, especially from the US, a decline in the Chinese economy or a collapse in the Chinese economy, that would spell disaster for the Western world as well. Now, I don't see this is necessarily the case. We're just getting some early signs that there has been a slowdown. I wouldn't necessarily be too worried because they actually did cut rates, which means they are trying to inject the economy with just a little more stimulus through monetary policy at the moment. So I don't think it's alarm bells yet, but it's certainly just one factor to be aware of in this current market climate. And we can see the DXY is currently bounced off this key zone as well. As long as the DS DXY looks bullish, I think it is hard for crypto and equities to rally because obviously a stronger DXY means more capital is flowing towards the US dollar and out of equities um, like the S&P 500 and crypto etc. Whereas a breakdown in the DXY or a, or a bearish DXY indicates that capital is flowing into equities and into crypto instead of into the US dollar. So a breakdown of this would be very bullish for crypto. Um, a breakdown of this channel into the long-term support line would be bullish. But at the end of the day, this is this chart is still looking bullish um, in terms of the DXY. So it's something to be very cautious of at the moment. Now, the data in terms of inflows was just published by CoinShares. They do a weekly report. And what it actually shows is that Bitcoin has negative weekly outflows. Now, we have seen positive inflows for the past few weeks, but it's starting just to tick a little bit bearish at the moment. This indicates to me that some investors are A, taking profits, and two, going slightly risk off um, with the potential of a, a, a slight stock market reversal over the next few weeks. So the weekly flows actually went out of Bitcoin, but altcoins are holding up surprisingly well. So maybe this Bitcoin outflow is due to the looming Mt. Gox unlock that's in a week. Maybe some investors are a little bit scared. Um, it could potentially be minor outflows as well, but that could be one catalyst as to why Bitcoin has stronger outflows than some of these other assets. And also the risk appetite for altcoins, although in general, the market has been risk off for quite some time due to the Ethereum price pumping, altcoins have performed quite strongly. And we can see this because the weekly inflows were actually positive for many of these altcoins. Solana, for example, was actually neutral, but its year to date flows are higher than almost any other altcoin. The other very interesting piece of data here is the short Bitcoin stat. Now, short Bitcoin is a fund which gives you exposure to the downside of Bitcoin. So if you're bearish on Bitcoin, the short Bitcoin inflows increased. And if you're bullish on Bitcoin, the short Bitcoin inflows decrease. We can see that there was actually for the first time in two months, an increase in the weekly inflows for the short Bitcoin fund, which means that investors um, are getting slightly more bearish on Bitcoin in terms of where they are allocating their capital. Now, can we see this reflected in the price? Only a little bit because the pullback hasn't been too severe, but I definitely think it's of note that some investors are taking the slightly risk off approach headed into these next couple of weeks into September. So that is just an interesting stat that I'm keeping my eye on. And I always look at the coin share weekly inflows and outflows each week to verify where institutions are allocating capital because you're going to capture this data much better on inflows than you are on price, which is highly retail dominant. Now let's look at DeFi Llama, which is going to give us an update on the current total value locked and the health of DeFi. We can see that apart from Polygon, it's the market has been mostly red over the last week, but Polygon has shown very, very strong relative strength versus the rest of the market. It has grown over 25% for the week. Um, and we're just seeing the strength of Polygon time and time again, not only with its business development, so its partnerships with Nike, Disney, Facebook, etc., but also the strength and the audacity for projects to deploy dApps on Polygon. We know the development activity on Polygon is now top three, according to GitHub, out of any chain. And we're now starting to see some of that strength exemplify as to where retail investors park their capital. We know TVL is highly retail dominant as DeFi right now um, hasn't really taken off in an institutional sense um, to the extent that it has amongst the DeFi market and, de and retail participants. So we know that Polygon um, is actually performing well in a retail sense. And that's one of the reasons why the price has performed so strongly leading into the Ethereum merge of which 
Polygon obviously being the L2 of Ethereum um, benefits from quite strongly. Optimism and Arbitrum have also seen this benefit being other L2s to Ethereum pumping 190% and 31% over the last month. But it's very clear what the trend is here. It's Ethereum related protocols and not specifically the EVM chains like BSC, AVAX, Phantom, etc., but more so the chains that have direct correlation to Ethereum um, in the way that they operate with their consensus mechanism, like the L2s, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Polygon, which can validate transactions off the Ethereum network using their bridges um, as L2 scaling solutions for Ethereum itself. That's a very interesting point. Jaren has an interesting point to do with Bitcoin specifically, and that's that the public miners are still dumping their Bitcoin holdings, but not nearly to the same extent as during the mining bloodbath earlier this year. So miners are still selling, but they only sold 6,200 Bitcoin in July, less than half the amount they sold the previous month. So a little bit of sell pressure was alleviated in July compared to June, and that would make sense as the Bitcoin price rallied from 17K to 24K. But this is a lagging indicator. So the mining data for the next month, which is August, hasn't come through. Could this latest drop off of the Bitcoin price and the net outflows for Bitcoin be related to miners? I think that this could be a partial reason as to why the market has dipped a little bit, although it is a decent sign um, that the miners aren't selling off as much as they are in June. But it makes complete sense because the miners will generally follow market sentiment, albeit in much larger quantities because they are mining and holding a lot of Bitcoin relative to other market sectors. Now, what I'm going to go through is Dogecoin in a second and look through um, the Dogecoin market, what Dogechain is and the meme coins that are performing extremely well and my overall thoughts on it. And then I'm going to go through real yield and look at two protocols, which I think are fundamentally undervalued in the market based on my last week of research. But before we go into that, um, I want to point out Certic's website, certic.com. There's a link in the description to click on this and just how good it is with this latest um, fe product feature that they've rolled out. Certic is now an official show sponsor. And honestly, I've been really impressed with this dashboard. It basically ranks projects for their trust score. It ranks them based on what's trending. And if you click on a project itself, so let's say we click on ShibaSwap, we can see um, not only the trust score, but the market and community score. You can look through their order to see if it's safe or not. You can look through their market cap, their volume. So they've got um, inbuilt APIs for all of this data. And they've also got a social sentiment index similar to Luna Crush. So it's, they're basically trying to be the one-stop shop for all crypto data and security. Obviously, they are the main sponsor of the channel, but I do personally use the website a lot. And I just wanted to remind you guys that before investing in a project, make sure you search if it has a Certic audit so you can verify whether the project's safe because we just saw uh, the Akala hack, which ended up not being such a major thing, but it was still a worry um, off the back of the major Solana hack the week before. We had the Nomad Bridge hack. We've had multiple hacks in crypto recently. And I think now more than ever, it's important to keep your funds safe because there's a lot of not only bad actors in crypto, but there's also a lot of risks when it comes to smart contracts. So if you're investing in DeFi, you want to make sure your funds are safe. And one way I do that is through Certic and their audits. Um, once again, they are the show sponsor, but I do use their product as well. So make sure you check them out. Link in the description and just add it to your bookmarks. Um, add it to your bookmarks so you can actually have an easy way to access the Certic website. So what you do is you just drag it into Chrome, drag and drop here. And now whenever you want to go onto Certic, you can just click on it and make it part of your daily routine, etc. But Dogecoin has been the coin that has shown almost the most strength out of any alt apart from the Ethereum ecosystem over the last couple of weeks. Now, why is this the case? Why is Dogecoin pumping? And should we Dogecoin pumping? And should we be FOMOing in or should we be shorting this? Has it overextended? Well, the first thing to know is that it's been absolutely crazy what has happened on Dogechain. If you guys don't know what Dogechain is, it's an EVM compatible layer one that is using Doge as the gas token of the layer one. So Dogecoin, a token that previously didn't have much utility at all, all of a sudden now has a use case. Now, what's that use case? Well, it's an active chain that can host NFTs, dApps, and all sorts of products similar to something like an AVAX or a Phantom can host because it's EVM compatible, meaning it's accessible from a MetaMask wallet. Now, is Dogechain the solution to Doge's utility issues? Well, I don't necessarily think it is, but it's definitely one factor as to why the Dogecoin token is being speculated on. And it also provides an extra use case. So although inherently, 
I don't think Doge Chain necessarily changes the Doge narrative too much. It does in the short term from the eyes of the retail participants. And we can see this exemplified via the sheer amount of liquidity that is pouring into some of these meme coins. We can see that some of these coins are up 17,000, 3,000, 2,000, multiple up hundreds of percents. And this is just today. Yesterday, I saw coins up like 5 million percent because obviously when coins launch, they start at zero and then the percentages um, adjust adequately. We have this coin at 999 trillion. I mean, that doesn't look right. That looks like botched numbers, but some of these coins have genuinely gone up like 11,000, 75,000 percent a day. So there's a lot of hype, but should you be getting on the hype train? Well, obviously this video is not financial advice, but I want to kind of go through my logic as to why this is happening and maybe how you can get involved if you choose to do so. Remember, None of this is financial advice. So the first thing is trading on Doge Chain. So obviously a lot of people are now taking part in these meme coin in this meme coin hype, trying to make a quick profit. The reason they're doing this is because there has been a confirmed airdrop. So Doge Chain does not currently have a token, but the token has been rumored to be called DC, standing for Doge Chain, and that token will only be given to people that bridge their assets across to the Doge Chain. What asset? Well, of course, Doge, because if you um, share your Dogecoin from your wallet onto the Doge Chain network, it will become wrapped Doge, W Doge, which is the native gas token of the network, and you can redeem it on the other side. So if you add the Doge Chain um, EVM chain to your MetaMask wallet, you enter in Doge chain and you bridge across using the Doge chain bridge. You can bridge your Doge Doge coin to Doge chain and become eligible for the airdrop. Now the airdrop has been rumored to be within the next couple months. Clearly the price action is telling us that it could be sooner or at least the speculation for this airdrop is happening sooner and that people are interested in not only claiming the airdrop, but also speculating on these crazy meme coin gains that we've seen over the last week. So if you do want to take advantage, you can deposit your Doge coin onto Doge chain if you're already holding Doge. That is, of course. But if you don't hold Doge, should you be getting your entry? Should you be aping in now? Or is this simply reserved for existing Dogecoin holders? Well, I'll be honest. I did open a little Dogecoin long. I'm just having a bit of fun speculation based on the relative strength we've seen from Doge. The RSI is starting to tick down a bit. And I'm seeing this next key level in accordance with this previous high um, as this uh, confluence point with the diagonal trend at 0 0.078. So this is the region where do where you really want Doge to bounce. And if it does bounce there, th then I think we can continue um, to the upside here. If it doesn't bounce there, then I do have lower price targets, which one of them is at um, this next level at the 7.4. And then we can probably come all the way back down to this range here. If we draw it in as a rectangle, you you'll get a better picture. Um, and this range here as kind of like an accumulation zone. However, I would be very risk averse when it comes to this. Only put in money that you can lose. And if you're longing Doge, you have to accept it's a meme coin. You're betting on meme ability and speculation, not necessarily utility. Because even though Doge chain technically is now giving utility to Doge, you can't tell me that Dogecoin at an $11.5 billion market cap is fully valued off the back of utility. It's not. It's a meme coin and it's primarily a meme coin. So you have to keep keep that into account if you do choose to long Doge. I wouldn't necessarily be shorting now because this is still a bullish pattern. So I am just looking for longs. I'm having a little bit of fun. Maybe I'll dabble in some of these memes for some fun, but it really is gambling money, guys. You have to make decisions on where you allocate your own capital. I'm not a financial advisor, but I'm just telling you that I am having a bit of fun with longing Dogecoin. But I think that the Doge chain launch, even though it may not inherently change the Dogecoin utility too much, although it is providing new ways to use Doge, I think it does have broader implications for the crypto market. I said to you before, when you're betting on Doge, you're betting on a meme. And I think a lot of people in the market, they kind of underestimate meme culture. Remember, meme coins were, were a very efficient way of get, getting more liquidity into the crypto market in 2021. The reason why we saw such crazy rallies in the crypto market and exposed retail participants to the market was because of memes. It was because of people like Elon Musk that pumped these memes. Think about it. Retail participants need a way to get exposure to crypto. They need a reason to open a MetaMask wallet. They need a reason to open an exchange account. Meme, way, meme coins give them um, a way and a reason to do this. And generally, those profits, or at least some of that liquidity and interest, siphons off into other altcoins. So you may bring uh, a retail participant in that invests in Dogecoin, and they are now exposed, and they're now set up with crypto wallets um, that 
can be used to purchase other altcoins. And maybe that piques their interest in other altcoins off the back of their meme coin exposure. And we've seen this with the NFT market on Solana growing so quickly. Look at the amount of people that are now interested in Solana and using Solana DeFi in the ecosystem because they invested speculatively in the NFTs. So I think we can't fade the importance of meme coins in crypto. They are so important for us as a community still. Would we like to see a future where we rely less on memes and more on utility? Yes, I would love to see that. Are we currently? No, it's still going to be a long transition away from that. Crypto inherently is born out of meme culture. You guys have been on crypto Twitter. You guys watch crypto YouTube. You know the drill. You know that meme coins and NFTs still run this market. And honestly, it can be a bit of fun if, if you're wise um, and very pragmatic with how much you're actually deploying because remember, it is a casino. So the, even the more established ones come with risk. It's only wise to allocate small position sizes, but they are a crucial component of the crypto economy. And I don't think they should be underestimated. One project that's not underestimating Dogecoin is Polygon. And this is actually because Dogecoin is built on Polygon. Matic is following the long list of projects that is being built upon from many other chains. Basically, any new chain that you speak to, most games, um, obviously not every chain, but a lot of them are now choosing to build on Polygon. Um, a lot of dApps are now building on Polygon. A lot of NFT projects are now building on Polygon. They've got the biz dev partnerships. This is just one more but, um, string to their bow with Doge Chain being launched on Polygon. I, I find it funny here that they actually tweeted this, um, kind of showing their, uh, in a roundabout way, support for the Doge Chain project. And I guess it's just one more reason, I guess, to be bullish on Polygon. Polygon is really killing the game right now. And for a while, I kind of doubted um, where Polygon really fits in with the with the entire Ethereum ecosystem because eventually kind of my thesis was what's the need for L2s if Ethereum succeeds? Why would you need a, ro a roll up or any scaling solutions? But then I realized something very key and this is that Ethereum probably won't be done with this five-step roadmap until 2023. 2030 or even beyond that 2023 to 2024 is when we'll get sharding it could be even later than that then the virgin the splurge which are their data storage solutions probably won't be happening till even after that and then they still have multiple upgrades like zk rollups and all sorts of other rollups to implement before we even start looking at the gas fee targets that vitalik was pointing out of 0.002 cents so when we look that far forward in the future that's a solid eight years that these l2 have have to genuinely generate network effect and generally generate hype and projects that want to build on them and develop ecosystems which work interoperably with Ethereum and Polygon being the, the Swiss army knife of L2 scaling solutions, I think deserves a place in everyone's portfolio, in my opinion. And that's one of the reasons why Polygon will probably be a staple of my L1 portfolio. Technically, it's an L2, but I put it under um, the, you know, the other bunch of these L1s in, in the way I structure my portfolio, it's going to be a central component because I see the value in just how much development is happening on this chain right now. It's astonishing. And I don't think anyone could fade it anymore if you were before. The other hot narrative right now, and this is the final point, but certainly not the least important point in today's video, this is the real yield narrative. And you guys have seen all over Twitter, I've posted many threads on this, um, how DeFi is now pivoting from unsustainable yield through token emissions that are paying these crazy 1000% APYs in order to offering sustainable yield through organic revenue generation. So projects that operate on real yield are projects that generate real revenue through swaps, through trading fees, and take a percentage of those profits and pay them back to holders. Now, the manner in which these projects pay back to holders, the percentage, that is up to the scrutiny of the project. But in general, real yield operates on the premise that re revenue paid to holders should be generated by real income and not just Ponzonomics or token emissions. Now, I did a whole thread on this. I gave five tokens that I, I'm bullish on in this sector. And I also gave another five in my previous thread. So I've given over 10 now. But I just want to talk about two today to keep it really simple. Because out of this whole thread, there are two that I like a lot. The first one is Dopex. Dopex is essentially a decentralized options exchange on Arbitrum. So options are a category of derivatives, which means you don't need to have spot exposure to an asset. You could purchase an option or a right to buy or sell an asset at a fraction of the price, um, which is more capital efficient in a lot of cases. But Dopex facilitates the decentralized trading of crypto specific options, which is a niche that hasn't really been tapped into into in crypto yet, but in the, the traditional finance world is abundant with over a $1 quadrillion 
dollar estimation of the total market cap size of the global derivatives market. Is this potentially an overestimation? Probably, because essentially anything could be considered a derivative when it comes to TradFi. Every commodity has derivatives. Every stock has derivatives. So you can see how this number piles up and starts to get a little bit skewed. But the underlying importance of this is that the world is dominated by derivatives. And if you can capture just a slice of this action, just half a percent, one percent in the crypto market, one percent would be amazing because that's trillions of dollars of inflows. And there are going to be projects that benefit off derivatives being probably the biggest narrative in crypto that's still untapped. So when I look at this narrative, there's one that stands out. There's a few, but in today's video for these all intents and purposes, one stands out and this is Dopex because it does offer efficient trading of crypto specific options, but it uses a very different mechanism to a lot of these other derivatives protocols and that is Atlantic. So they maintain fixed option expiration dates, but allow users to access collateral. In layman's terms, this means if you have liquidity, so you have money that you want to invest in an option, you can invest in that option, but then also get your tokens back or get liquidity back that you can then use to invest in productive assets. So let's say you invest $5,000 in options. Instead of tying up all your liquidity in options, you can use that liquidity um, aside from the option investment to use that to invest in productive assets. So you might want to invest in Ethereum if you're bullish into the ETH merge. You might want to invest in other yield protocols. You might want to use that to buy more options. Whatever you want to do, it's essentially a leverage play, but that is allowing people more um, customization over where they actually allocate capital very cool feature that I haven't seen many other derivative crypto platforms doing, to be honest, because there's only like two or three of them that are very valid, in my opinion. You've got um, what's it called? Ribbon Finance. You've got Synthetics, SNX, which is taking real yield deri- real world derivatives. But Dopex is really the go-to options exchange right now, or at least one of them. Um, they have Atlantic Straddles options, which are very cool as well, which allow you to bet on asset volatility. And overall, it's just a very good product. And I think at a $37 million TBL and a $95 million market, market cap, this is still relatively undervalued compared to its potential. Now, it has done a 3x since its lows. I said this on the banter show earlier where I did a lot more in-depth dive into real yield. You can check that out using the link in the description that I am separating my portfolio in two ways right now. I've got my key portfolio, which is my L1s, my bigger bets, my Binance's, my FTT's, Bitcoin's, Ethereum, Solana's, like these major coins with big market caps that I'm holding. And then I'm segmenting roughly 20 to 30% of my total portfolio into a little DeFi portfolio that I'm building. And this smaller DeFi portfolio is going to be geared towards capital generation through real yield projects. Now, with this smaller percentage of my portfolio, something like a Dopex probably gets a 5 to 10% weighting of this. And I'm DCA into this over time. Personally, I believe if you're investing with a one to two year time horizon or more, we are probably going to get better entries at some point within the next six months. Thus, there's no reason to ape into these protocols right now. This isn't a buy signal and I don't like doing buy signals because the way you DCA and the way you accumulate is relative to how much cash you have and your own personal portfolio. But me personally, I'm keeping a fairly heavy cash weighting and then I'm going to be slowly DCAing in. When the market gets lower, I will ramp up those DCAs because I operate on a percentage-based DCA system where I DCA heavier when prices are low and I DCA less when prices are high. And that's no different when it comes to Dopex. Um, But I do think at a sub 100 mil market cap, just compared to the derivative sector, this becomes a little bit of a no-brainer. And then the other one, which I won't go too in-depth about, because I did it on Banter earlier, but the TLDR is Kujira, a project that was b- born on Terra, a project that was exposed to the lunar UST collapse, but rose from the ashes like a phoenix. They've made a f- commendable recovery. And I really commend the team and their actions over the past few months to be able to launch such great products despite having such adversity and very limited runway after the lunar collapse. They stuck to their guns. They launched their own chain on Cosmos and they onboarded a lot of the Terra community that were broken into this new project, which is giving everyone hope again. And that's why I really like what the team has been able to do. The TLDR is they have three products. Orca, which allows you to get cheaper assets. So if you want to buy Ethereum, you can get it slightly cheaper as it relies on discounts through liquidations. You've got Fin, which is an order book exchange, which doesn't rely on LPs. So a normal DEX like Uniswap or Curve Finance would use liquidity pools in order to facilitate swaps. Whereas this uses an order book, so you need buyers and sellers at certain prices to validate transactions. 
What's the benefit of this? Well, you don't rely on impermanent loss. So you don't rely on people staking um, during really volatile market conditions. The demand for staking goes down because people don't want to experience impermanent loss. And as emissions dry up on some of these other DEXs, uh, a lot of people won't be as incentivized to stake these tokens in LPs. Therefore, they'll have less liquidity. So an order book exchange goes on the premise um, that it can be a little more resilient and it, it's not... Um, it's not kind of at the behest of whether the market is risk on or risk off. Although it does have its own issues. For example, right now, Kojira is fairly low in liquidity compared to other exchanges. I do think the order book model, specifically the decentralized order book model, is a unique um, unique competitive advantage that Kojira actually has. And then blue is the Kuji dashboard for you to vote, bond, uh, operate governance, etc. So holders can actually vote over where they want to see the protocol going in the future. So there's a lot to like about Kuji and there's a lot to like about Dopex and the other three that are in my Twitter. If you want to check out the Twitter thread, link in the description to that. Uh, that goes through another 10 if you include part one. But those are the two that are standing out to me as great risk reward plays sub 100 million market cap or Kujira is just slightly over, but still, you know, relatively, um, I mean, undervalued is, is a hard word to use because all you really have is other crypto projects to quantify off, but relatively undervalued compared to their scope for growth, specifically Dopex. I've been really impressed with my research over the past few days into Dopex. I'm going to continue to research and maybe do tutorials on the channel about it because I, I think it has a lot of potential. But let me know what you thought of this, this video, guys. We went through a lot of ground and um, we covered the Bitcoin market, the inflows, the TVL. We covered Certic. Make sure to check them out. Thank you for sponsoring the show, Certic. Link in the description. We covered Dogecoin and my thoughts on that. And we covered um, real yield and yeah, the current market. So we've talked about a lot in 30 minutes. You might need to watch on a half speed because I, I spoke pretty fast throughout the whole video, but I want to give you guys this alpha quick and easy and in a digestible manner. Hopefully it was digestible. Um, make sure you smash a like and subscribe if you're not already. Uh, and I'll see you on the weekend. I'll be uploading on this channel. You guys already know that I stream every single day in crypto banter. So if you want to see my face every day, some of you may hate my face and not want to see it every day, that's fine. But for those who do want to see my face every day, I stream every single day on crypto banter at 7.30 p.m. EST, so New York time, um, if you want to come and hang out there. If not, I'll see you on this channel in just a few days. Have a lovely day.